Welcome to this week's edition of Music of Hope and Comfort. We hope you will be comforted and perhaps inspired by today's selections. I'm Carl Byrne, the organist here at St. John's Lutheran Church in downtown Lombard, and I'm again joined by our organist colleague, friend Paul Frazee, and Rick Schultz, our splendid videographer and film editor. This week you will see and hear an encore presentation from our video library. Our videographer and film editor, Rick Schultz, is enjoying some time off, so we've pulled out from the Film Vault a program featuring the hymns of Martin Luther. Reformation Day is coming up on October 31st. Next week, we will be celebrating Saint All Saints Day, which is on November 1st. Our program today, uh, our program then features hymns of trust. We hope you enjoy this special encore presentation. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Music of Hope and Comfort. I'm Carl Bruni, organist here at St. John's Lutheran in Lombard. I'm joined by my organist friend and colleague, Paul Frazee, and by Rick Schultz, our masterful videographer, video editor, and master of all trades here at St. John's. This week's topic is, or are, three of my favorite subjects, hymns, organ chorale preludes based on hymns, and mostly today, the hymns of Martin Luther. We sing many of Luther's hymns found in our hymnal today, and we, are, uh, we will be highlighting those hymns that are more frequently sung. Luther, Luther wrote hymns for basically all the occasions of the liturgical year that we celebrate. They are, include Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Lent, Easter, Pentecost, and Holy Trinity. He also wrote some hymns having to do with the Catechism, including the Ten Commandments, the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, Baptism, Confession, and Holy Communion. Luther worked on these tunes, hymn tunes, sometimes modifying old tunes, making them more singable for his congregation. Ruth, Luther wrote about 41 hymns, of which 23 are in our current hymnal. His texts mostly come from inspiration from the Bible. For example, seven of his hymns come from the Psalms, the most famous being, A Mighty Fortress is a God, which comes from Psalms 46. Psalm 46 begins with these words, God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Luther considered hymns, including their music, an important means in the development of one's faith. Luther used hymns, his and others, as a way to lead people, mostly commoners and peasants back then, to better understand what was in the scriptures. <clears throat> a few notes about Martin Luther. <clears throat> His dates are from 1483 to 1546. <clears throat> As a point of reference, Columbus sailed to the New World in 1492 when Luther was nine years old. Luther came from a musical family. He loved singing and played several musical instruments, including the lute. <clears throat> Luther would often express the importance of music and that the only thing more important than music was the word of God. He would lead congregational singing, which was a rather new idea back then, <clears throat> and was convinced congregational singing would inspire his congregation and other church leaders. People found a better understanding in God's word through music. Also by having the congregational singing, it gave them more participation in the worship service as it still does today. Since his most famous hymn is, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, we will begin and end today's program with organ variations based on his powerful hymn, sometimes called the Lutheran National Anthem. He was called that because of the effect it had in increasing the support for the Reformation cause back then. A Mighty Fortress is found in virtually every American hymnal, including the various Catholic hymnals, and probably in most, if not all, Christian hymnals throughout the world. The original melody and text by Luther is extremely rhythmic and is a bit confusing to non-Lutherans, but it's the one we sing here at St. John's. It goes, a mighty fortress is our God. The rhythm is like that. <clears throat> Most other Christians sing it in a more smoothed out and less energetic way. Both versions are in our hymnal. This powerful hymn was translated into English a number of times, but the first one is in 1539, by Miles Coverdale. Of course, you remember who Miles Coverdale was. Coverdale produced the first complete print translation of the Bible in English 
1535. Luther did the first version of the hymnal of the Bible completely in German, but Coverdale did it in English. The Mighty Fortress has been translated into English by others over the years. The version in 1853 uh, that some of us remember is the one that talks about a bulwark never failing. <clears throat> the translation we use now is done by a committee of scholars, while the, while the book, The Companion to the Hymns, says that the translation uh, we use stays quite close to the original German in meaning. It's a bit wooden, that's what they say, but we still all love it. We will begin with A Mighty Fortress, played by Paul. was by Paul Bunges. He was in the faculty at Concordia River Forest for many years, and he was the chairman of the music department there, and designed over 100 pipe organs for churches and colleges, including our 1981 Zimmer pipe organ here at St. John's Church. Um, the piece was, was played by, uh, was written by Dr. Bunges. It was in the Lutheran worship, our old hymnal, and it was it. It's hymn number five, 656. The next piece is played by Paul. Uh, it's uh, hymn number 358. Um, it's an arrangement of a very favorite Christmas piece, one of my favorites, From Heaven Above to Earth I Come. This hymn text was by Luther, all 15 verses, which was translated from German into English by, you guessed it, Catherine Winkworth. You may recall her name from previous editions of this program. She translated uh, into English 46 hymns that are in our hymnal from German into English. Nobody knows who wrote this noble tune, but it first appeared in 1539 in a hymnal called Gestleichische Lieder, published in Leipzig seven years before Luther's death. This arrangement Paul will be playing is from an organ book by Bach called the Orgelbuchlein, a book most organists use. The, the melody is in there, but it's a bit ornamented. Listen carefully. Next hymn by Luther is number 332, Savior of the Nations Come. 
Um, it's in a, a chorale prelude based on the famous Advent hymn text by Luther. The hymn text is attributed to Ambrose of Milan, who lived from 340 to 397 AD, a long time ago. Ambrose has two other hymns in our hymnal. Luther translated this eight stanza lit Latin hymn into German, and it was later translated into English by various folks. This charming arrangement of Savior of the Nations Come is by Andreas Fetter, who was a North German composer in the early 1700s. He was a student of Johann Pachelbel. Most of Vetter's music has been lost or destroyed by various wars or varmen. We still have 17 fine pieces of his. This arrangement is a short fugette, or a little fugue, based on the first line of the text, Savior of the Nations Come. You will hear the eight note theme, eight notes, repeated a number of times, and sometimes, like at the beginning, the notes of this eight note theme are overlapping. For the, in the first six measures, the theme is played four times. That's a lot. Let me play the theme for you. Here it is again. Here it is again. Each time it's in a different key. So listen carefully because they all overlap. Next piece is hymn number 607, From Depths of Woe I Cry to Thee. The text and tune of this hymn were by Martin Luther, but the melody has been arranged here by Samuel Scheidt. It is a very contemplative piece based on the text of uh, Psalm 130, From Depths of Woe I Cry to Thee. The melody is clearly stated in the soprano or top part, is accompanied by moving parts in what sounds like a minor key, but it's actually in a thing called the Dorian mode. It seems to me it expresses sorrow like the psalm. There are several descending musical lines in this arrangement by Scheidt, perhaps symbolizing the depths of woe that Luther was writing about or going through himself. This is a true German chorale in that the second line of the melody is exactly the same as the first line of the melody. It's repeated by the singers and or the organist to further help the congregation learn the melody so that they could sing it even better. I will play the piece with the same repeated notes in the second line, but with contrasting accompaniment. The text of the first verse reads, From depths of woe I cry to thee in trial and tribulation. Bend down thy gracious ear to me, Lord, hear my supplication. If thou rememberest every sin, who then could heaven ever win or stand before thy presence?
next piece is A Mighty Fortress. Um, it's an arrangement by Johann Walther. I love this hymn. In this arrangement, the melody is boldly proclaimed above the quickly moving accompaniment, filled with lots of running 16th notes. Walther was Bach's cousin and lived almost exactly at the same time as Bach. Walther was born in 1684, Bach in 1685, and Walther died in 1748, and Bach died in 1750. In addition to writing scores of wonderful organ chorale preludes like this one, Walther was also the author of the first musical dictionary in German, which was completed in 1732 and reissued in 2001, so it's still out there. It not only contained musical terms like all musical dictionaries should, but was the first dictionary in the world to contain biographies of famous composers and performers from what was that era and from previous ones. next piece is Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord, Paul Crazy will be playing this piece. next piece is hymn number 954, We All Believe in One True God. This wonderful text, is the, this next piece, We All Believe in One True God, is a paraphrase by Luther of the Nicene Creed written to be, uh, to be used as a catechism hymn. The ancient creed was adopted at the first council of, the, of Nicaea in June of 325, a long time ago. 
was originally written in Greek and translated into Latin and uh, uh, Martin Luther translated into German. The tune of this piece is based on an ancient 14th century chant. This arrangement of this ancient piece is by Bach. It contains two easy to remember motifs or short bits of melody. Paul will demonstrate for us the initial theme found in our hymnal. Next, Paul will demonstrate the repeated faith motif that Bach wrote into this grand piece, and it's in the pedal part. Next, want a challenge? How many times do you hear the second motif, the faith motif? Let me know the number and you will win this week's contest. Okay, here we go with Paul.
make the contest fair, you need to call me. My cell phone number is 630-707-7655, and we can go to Culver's or to Dairy Queen for the winner. Okay, let me... Our next piece is hymn number 617, O Lord, We Praise Thee. Uh, it's a Lutheran, it's a Lutheran uh, Lord's Supper hymn. We've sung it 18 times since our new hymnals come out, and it's a terrific hymn. This arrangement is by a favorite communion hymn here at St. John's is by Walter Hennig, who was the music director and the organist at Fortsheim in Germany. He lived from 1903 to 1965. The familiar melody of this arrangement is played on my left hand on the great or the lower keyboard, while my right hand plays around and kind of imitates the tune on the swell or the top keyboard. Next hymn is number 655, Lord, Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word. This one we've sung 19 times since the new hymnals come out. Uh, this hymn is most interesting, has most interesting history. Back in 1541, it had appeared as if the Sultan Suleiman and his Turkish army might overrun Germany. They had recently taken Hungary and were threatening right up to the walls of Vienna. The Elector of Germany requested that pa pastors offer prayers for Germany's protection, and in response, Martin Luther wrote this hymn, which was prepared for a special service. The original text, the original text reads, Lord, keep us in thy work and word. Restrain the murderous Pope and Turk, who fain would tear off thy throne, Jesus Christ, thy beloved Son. Later, Luther saw the church was threatened less, more spiritually and less by the, uh, the sultan, uh, and he rewrote the words, which are the ones that we use today. Catherine Winkworth translated Luther's words into what we use today. It's from her book, The Corral Book from England, published in 1863. We use a lot of her translations. The organ arrangement I'm playing is the grand and frequently sung hymn by Johann Walther, box cousin. It is in the form of a trio. My right hand and left hand are playing two different ornamented parts while the melody or the chorale is played with my feet. You will easily be able to hear the melody.
next hymn is number 458, Jesus Christ Lay in Death Strong Band. Um, our next piece was written by a lesser known composer, but a favorite of mine, Friedrich Wilhelm Zachau. He was born in 1663, 23 years before the birth of Bach, and he lived in Leipzig, where Bach spent the last 27 years of his life. Zakau is probably most famous for being the music teacher of a bunch of musicians. The most famous being he was the first teacher of George Frederick Handel. He taught Handel to play the organ and violin and harpsichord and oboe, as well as music theory. This piece was an arrangement of Luther's Easter hymn is in a 6-4 rhythm, a rather fast, festive dance-like rhythm to reflect on Easter's celebration of Christ's victory over death. The text of the first verse reads, Jesus Christ lay in death strong bands for our offenses given, but now at God's right hand he stands and brings us life from heaven. Therefore, let us joyful be and sing to God right thankfully loud songs of Alleluia, Alleluia. <laughs> Zimbelstern, that's one of the neat stops on the organ. It's a series of a bunch of bells that we use for festive occasions like Easter and Christmas. Can you hear it? Kind of neat. Our last piece for today is A Mighty Fortress. Paul will finish the program at this version. This one is composed by a North German organist and composer, Johann Nicholas Hanf, who lived from 1663 to 1711 at the age of 33, became the organist and conductor of a significant major church in Lübeck. In his compositions like this one, he boldly proclaimed the melody and slowly moving, uh, is moving slowly, surrounded by more quickly moving accompaniment. For those of you who love trivia, uh, Johann Nicholas Hanf has an asteroid named after him. It's asteroid number 7,902, and it was named in his honor in 1997. Okay, here's Paul. <clears throat>
Thank you for listening and watching our program today. I also want to thank Rick Schultz, our videographer and film editor, and my colleague and friend Paul Frazee. We hope you've enjoyed listening to our Music of Hope and Comfort program, and that you know a little bit more about these mostly familiar pieces by Martin Luther. Our topic next week will be communion hymns. If you have an idea or two about a topic for a future program, please send them to me. My email address is brun, B-R-U-H-N, dot saint dot johns at gmail dot com. Keep well and God's blessings on your day. I hope to see you in worship again soon.